Wow, 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 wow. Hello, hello, hello. I'm happy to be back with you once again, beloved. It's Kevin. This is another episode of A Tiny Revolution. We're back in it last week. Some, you know, um, mental health is a journey, isn't it? It's a lot. And uh, last week, some of my mental health like coincided with some insomnia that I was feeling and that coincided with some work not happening. So I just want to say if you're out there and you're feeling like you're supposed to be producing a whole lot of shit because it seems like you're quote unquote not doing anything. It's not that you're not doing anything. It's just that you have a lot more time on your hands because you're at home all the time and you don't need to overwork yourself. Kevin said to himself on the air in order to uh, make other people happy or even just like, you know, make the world happy. Just do what is going to bring you joy. Okay. Um, now, of course, within reason, make sure you're doing all the things you got to do to like pay your bills and shit. But I'm just here to say, just be easy with yourself. I know I've had to learn that. And that's, I think, a real big part of my lessons that I'm learning right now is how do I be gentle with myself? And it's something I talk about so often, and it's because the thing I have the most trouble with. So as I tell you, I hope that it continues to grow in me as well. So remember, like I say every single week, take your meds, call your person, be kind to yourself, move your body in a way that feels good, eat something delicious, all that good shit. Anyways, I am thrilled to be on this week with new internet friend, um, Juliana Zobrist. And when I tell you this conversation was fire, you were just going to There are moments when we start preaching. There is moments when we go into it. There's moments when we call out our faith tradition. There are moments when we like start pioneering new theology. It's some really brilliant stuff. And I'm really, really excited to share this conversation with you. A little bit about Juliana Zobrist. She is a mother, an artist, a speaker, an author of the book, Pull It Off, Removing Your Fears and Putting on Confidence. Now, Rather than just going over her bio, I'm going to let her introduce herself to you because uh, before uh, getting to know her through this interview, I had little idea who she was, but hearing her story and who she has been to so many people is such a beautiful thing. So I can't wait to share this with you. I want to give a little bit of a content and trigger warning for this conversation. In our conversation, Juliana talks about her story, which includes scenes of sexual assault. So if you are somebody who um, is very easily triggered by things like that, um, just watch yourself, listen with caution. And if you need to take a step away from it, um, feel free to take a step away from it or fast forward um, through the conversation to a different part. So again, that's the caveat that the trigger warning is for all y'all out there. But I cannot wait. You guys go get yourself something to drink. Get yourself, if, you're, if, it's, if it's morning, get yourself coffee. If it's the evening, pour yourself a glass of wine. If you're sober, pour yourself something that you enjoy, some tea. I have a friend who is into very non-alcoholic beer. That's their thing. But whatever you're into, whoever you're into, whatever you're doing, I hope that you are ready for this conversation with my new friend, Juliana Zobrist. Um, well, Juliana Zobrist, and I'm a writer and have been an artist for like the last six years of my life in the Christian pop world. And then about four years ago began just naturally as faith does, as it evolves, Mm -hmm. began just dismantling really, um, my own pre-constructed ideas and beliefs that I had sort of inherited Right. And that weren't necessarily, um, you know, in, intimate to myself or mm. something that I held on my own. So, um, yeah, so I'm a writer and speaker and artist as well. And I am so anxious for this world to start revolving again so that we can be in public arenas together and oh. performances together. I just miss the collectiveness of community. Yeah. How have you, how, you know, how have you fared during coronacation? Like, I know, I, I think so many of us, we started out, we're just like, I'm going to do a zillion push-ups every day. Everyone <laughs> get on the Zoom work. And I'm over here. Like I did the reverse. I started off in like the gloom and doom. And then I moved into like 
now I'm swinging around <laughs> kettlebells and shit. But anyway, yes. how have you how have you spent coronation? Well, I have three children, and so it began with taking a stab at homeschooling, which was not an anticipated yikes know, and wow. new job for myself. So mm-hmm. um, we did that, but it's been it's been okay. I mean, my heart's heavy for the mm-hmm. world at this time for a number of different reasons, obviously, with everything yeah. that we're walking through and, and the new sort of the, the movement that's happening in our world. Right. And um, so it's been a sweet time to educate my kids and to learn myself and kind of, you know, mm-hmm. come face to face with my own ignorance. And, mm-hmm. and, and then as it concerns coronavirus, just being able to love the people around me by mm. wearing a mask, you know. What a, what a very simple and easy concept. <laughs> I would I would love to um, pick your brain a little bit. You come from CCM world, and you said that your faith just naturally evolved, which I think is a lot of times like that's like the best case scenario. Some people like when they sense it evolving, they just ignore it and it like grows. It's like a vine and just keeps growing. And then all of a sudden mm-hmm. they turn around and they have all this overgrowth of questions mm-hmm. that they didn't spend, mm-hmm. ooh, that they did not spend time pruning Yeah. get the answers. Come on, metaf- metaphysical. <laughs> this is me because I got a degree in, I got a degree I in, the- uh, in practical theology, my master's in practical theology. So just oh, like- okay. And I also lived in evangelical world for forever. So forever yes. coming up with a sermon illustration. <laughs> yes, yes, you did. <laughs> um, yes, you did. But what was the thing that when you started to notice, oh, I don't know if I believe this anymore. What was that thing? Um, I can tell you very specifically what it was. I was raised in an evangelical home. My dad is an evangelical pastor, evangelical free. And so I grew up walking through the doors of the church and knew nothing except for the language of the church. Right. And, and quite honestly, um, felt very at home there. When I was 12 years old, I was molested at a church camp by six men. My God. And when I was found my little pink sports bra on and t-shirt in my hands on the bathroom floor, concrete walls. And when I was found um, by someone at the youth camp, they asked me, was I okay? Yes, I'm okay. Clearly not okay, but yeah, I'm okay. I'm 12, you know. Did they hurt you? No. Um, Mm. Do you want to forgive or do you want to press charges? At 12. At 12. Mm. I didn't even know what sex was, right. you know? Right. And then the other question was, well, were you raped? And I said, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Oh, thank God you're still a virgin. That's what they said. Um. And so my, like my belief in God, my faith in God is the God that met me in the woods that night. Like oh. that is my God. Mm. And he, that has always been my God. So yes. any kind of religious judgmentalism or any kind of weaponization of the Bible or of faith or of this, you know, biblical shaming um, or the institutionalized reality of mm-hmm. religion has never fit with me. Right. Yeah. Because my God was the God that met me in the woods of that rescued me. That's my God. And I've carried that with me my, my whole life. And, um, you know, Walt Whitman says to reexamine all that you've been told in school or in church or in any book and dismiss whatever insults your own soul. And so ever since I was a child, I was able to do dismiss that. Dismiss what thing. insults your own soul? Yes. yes. Oh, wow. Which, I didn't. Mm. Yes, I have that. I have that written on my my wall in my little. I call it an office, but it's literally a cube, um, because really that's the work. Like if we're created in the image of God, which I have Plato tattooed on my arm. If we're created in the image of God, and we inherently possess this divinity of God Himself, He's imprinted within the souls and the minds and the hearts mm-hmm. of 
each one of us and we see it expressed mm -hmm. in our creativity and in our proclivities and in our self-expression and all of mm -hmm. in the way that we live our lives and the way that we love mm -hmm. um that is god himself so you're able to trust mm -hmm. your heart you know you're yeah. able to trust and dismiss what insults your soul because what you're dismissing is something that is not god yes and so yeah. as i Ooh, can i just pause for two seconds and just camp yeah, on that for a yeah, second <laughs> Because, oh, you got me and the Holy Ghost is rolling in me now. So it's like, uh, I am a big fan of a book called A Course in Miracles. It's a metaphysical text. And one of the lessons in there is um, God is but love and therefore so am I. And yes. during, uh, there was a period of review. It's like every 20 or so lessons, there's a review and they'll go back over the last 20, 25 lessons. And so this one had all of these things interspersed with God is but love and therefore so am I lesson mm -hmm. god is but love and therefore so so like for all of last month like in my meditations like um that's all i would be repeating to myself over and over and mm -hmm. over again and what you described there is that god being in every single thing so if i am if i am as god created me if i'm made of love mm -hmm. then everything that springs forth from me can only be but love and if it is not love then it is not god and therefore i can dismiss it even the behaviors in myself so it's mm. like when i have and this is like i think how this applies to today when we have like a racist behavior that pops up in ourself um as mm. white and white passing people when i have a transphobic thought that comes in me as a queer person when mm. i have a thought against um uh, a person who looks like they might be experiencing poverty or homelessness. Mm -hmm. Like anytime I have these judgments that come in, because God, what does God see? God sees love and love only sees love. And this is not to dismiss any of these identities because we have to see them in their fullness to address the problems. And once mm -hmm. we address the problems, then we don't have to worry about them. Mm -hmm. And that's how we change the world is if we can get yeah. this thing right. If I can see love in myself, and then I see love suffering in the world, if you will, at the mm -hmm. hands of the systems, at the hands of these all these fearful illusions that we can dismantle anytime we want to. But mm -hmm. again, when you're stuck in the fearful nightmare of 2,000 years, baby, it's hard to wake up. Anyways. <laughs> it oof. is. No, you're right, though. I, I love what you're saying. Um, because that belief like the the fundamental philosophy of mm -hmm. god being love and uh, the the belief in that we are made in the image of god so therefore made in the image of love mm -hmm. um changes the way that we see the entire world yes. you know and it changes the way that we interact with one another for me growing up being taught um inadvertently and mm -hmm. sometimes directly you know, that these people, you know, uh, anti-gay, you know, mm -hmm. very anti-gay, very um, racial and under, racist undertones for sure. Um, mm -hmm. But then when you step back and you think, but wait a minute, God created mm -hmm. me as a human and he doesn't make mistakes or God mm -hmm. does not, make, he, she does not make mistakes and God is love and he's created us in his image. Therefore, we have this inherent value and worth and mm -hmm. equality before one another mm -hmm. it's almost as if god fractioned himself out into humanity because not one of us could wholly possess and fully possess the character of god <laughs> yeah I love, listen i wish everyone could see you you're, you're listen so see good. i am people know that i'm a hanky wave i'm a hanky waving christian woman uh because i like <laughs> I, I fell into pentecostalism a little bit in college and so when i um <laughs> When I got to this uh, point on the other side, it's just like, um, I'm like, well, those kinds of expressions where it's just like, just like loud and like, that's what I loved about a lot of my faith too, is like, it was very like expressive in the body. And so like, I learned, like, I think what's interesting is like Pentecostalism kind of taught me how to be in my body a little bit more. It didn't mm -hmm. teach me how to deal with desire. Um, it taught me how to fight desire and, and crush it down but as far as just like the gift of expressive worship for me that was the first time it was okay for me as someone who's coded as a man to move mm -hmm. my body and to be emotional um mm -hmm. and so oddly enough that was the gift of that world and then they you know 
like you said, it's like whenever something becomes an institution, it be, like it ceases to be God. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah, so God cannot be quantified or qualified in such mm-hmm. narrow ways as to yeah. as as to hold him within the walls of the church. This that is something that I have loved about being quarantined is that we've all sort of been forced to sift out these institutions that we mm. that we are naturally a part of and necessarily a part of, of some of them and it's almost like the great equalizer because my faith doesn't lie dormant within the church because I can't I? walk through the doors my mm-hmm. faith is still alive and furious and burning within me um you know for me the the moment when you talk about like that moment mm-hmm. where things start to dismantle or deconstruct right was about four years ago i was holding my um my newborn daughter in my arms and i was simultaneously nursing her taking a splinter out of my older daughter's hand and trying to type up my speech for tour. I was going on tour. So I was going to be speaking and singing. I sing on like the bookends of my tours and speak in the middle. I'm speaking to women and to girls and I'm working on this and I'm just feeling completely overwhelmed because I have a four month old daughter and in two months I'm going on tour and I have like this nice little glazed donut midsection happening. Like I'm completely out of shape, Mm -hmm. you know? And, um, like I'm not feeling my best things are study, gross. not feeling my best <laughs> not sleeping at night and I'm like what on earth what the hell am I doing with my life and I went back to the to the books and to the literature that I had always read which were these these Christian books that were addressing women specifically a women's purpose mm-hmm. etc and all of the books addressed women as mothers, you know, our role as mothers, our role Mm as wives, our role, um, you know, keeping up the house and reading the Bible and uh, discipling one another and being mentored by one another, all good things. But I'm looking at my infant Mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, according to these books, she has no purpose yet. Like according to these books, because she's not a wife, she's not a mom, she doesn't have a house, she can't even read. She can't even speak yet. And what if she can't read? And what if she doesn't want to have children? And what if she's gay? And what if, like, what if all of these things, you know? Mm. And I thought, according to these books, my daughters have no purpose until they are able to be a wife. Fill these women's roles. Fill these roles. Wow, wow, wow. That was the moment, like the punctilier moment where I thought this great use of the like, word punctilier. God, God damn, that was good. <laughs> this feels like bullshit. Yeah. And and it's not to say that those things aren't good, you know, but there's got to be more, you know, why mm-hmm. did Christ come as a baby, completely helpless? Like yeah. this. And so that was the moment for me that I started as Whitman says, re-examining everything. Mm -hmm. So I started studying philosophy, started researching like the the history of religion and all of these things. And um, it's amazing what you find out when you are actually get like, just like I took my first course at um, Columbia Theological was, mm -hmm. um, uh, oh, was two of them, Old Testament and the history of Christianities, plural. Like as okay. in like all of the early Christianities that were like sprouting up in the ancient Near East around yes. the time of Jesus and how these different traditions interpreted and practiced and and uh, then also like studying how anthropologically the Bible, both um, what we call the Old Testament uh, and uh, how it was all compiled. Like how did we get this thing that we call the, Bi- the Bible mm-hmm. TM mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and just beginning to see the pieces of like, cause I remember someone, like I was talking with someone, I'm just like, but how do we know that the people at the Council of Trent like actually like did it right? What if they got it wrong? Well, we just have to trust the Holy Ghost. Right. And I'm like- The Holy Ghost are those men. I'm just like, I do trust the Holy <laughs> Ghost. But the thing is like, the Holy Ghost doesn't exactly like confirm or deny <laughs> things like that, you know? Like yes. I called her up and she's like, oh, that one time? Yeah, hold on. I think I remember. Oh, it's hazy. It was a couple thousand years ago. But just like, <laughs> that's not how she works. 
I know. But that's it. It's that one thing that's just like, let me examine it. But it's amazing if we can get just like, I, I want there to be more accessible things, more accessible like education around yes. our faith for people. Yes. That's something I'm, I'm starting to get passionate about and get into. But anyways, yes. you started Absolutely. realizing Absolutely. it that it wasn't true. Yeah, it, it was dismantling the, what I had just kind of inherited as a belief system and re-examining and learning and holding on to fiercely mm -hmm. that God at 12 years old, that God who was an advocate, mm -hmm. um, the Jesus who welcomes the immigrants and the poor and the oppressed and the marginalized and advocates on their, on their behalf. Mm -hmm. um, that became my faith and my unassailable faith. And, you know, there's so much freedom and liberation and being able to hold so tightly to this mustard seed. It truly feels like a mustard seed mm -hmm. because it's like, and, and be able to listen and to commune and to talk to and, and, you know, discuss with other people of different faiths and see where the two interconnect and mm -hmm. intersect and be able to honor one another's stories. And so now at this point in my life, um, I will be writing again. Nice. So excited. And then hopefully once the world starts spinning, mm -hmm. we'll be together collectively yeah. and encouraging one another together. That's the hope. Yes. Let's, uh, let's plan a play date. We'll get together and so, <laughs> we'll get together in some city and do a thing. Because yes, I am because that is my what I think has been so interesting uh, among many things, like you said. Uh, kind of it's I've seen kind of like this uptick in people like starting to ask the big questions mm -hmm. since all like you know, since um, you know, Corona Cation started, obviously. But then even beyond that, uh, I've noticed like an uptick in people asking questions like, right, why do I believe what I do? Mm -hmm. And how does what I believe actually impact the way I relate to humanity? And what, yeah. like, and realizing that like, it is a, that a, a, a better way is possible. And B, they, I think people are starting con to consider the idea that maybe to be wrong isn't to be bad. Like that's mm. the thing, you can be wrong. You just need to be, you, as Jesus would say, you need to repent. You need to change right. your mind. <laughs> yeah. And that's all it is. It's just like, uh, if you can change your mind about something, it's, it's, it makes it a lot easier. And that's all we're really doing is, mm -hmm. when you, and when you put it that way, it seems very simple. And mm. then at the same time, you run into people who you say Black Lives Matter and mm. they are incensed. You say, uh, you know, marriage is, you know, not just between one man and one woman. They just say, you're uh, destroying my rights or something like that. So it's, it's very okay. interesting to, to see how many people are asking questions. And I know that for you, you've had a real big uptick as you started speaking like specifically to like LGBTQ stuff and had some folks pouring into you. So what was that like as you were kind of opening those doors? Yeah, I took um, almost about eight months off of social media um, and really reason being I just needed to gather my own thoughts right. because this process of um, unlearning and relearning had been over the last four years of my life and I needed to come out and say, okay, this is, these are like my statements. <laughs> this is, this is what I need to tell you. you I know, need to give you guys is, my statement of belief. Yes, my statement of belief. That's what it felt like. And I just wanted to be very clear. You know, I wanted to be very clear because when you, when I have worked and have loved and have served for so many years, the Christian community, I think there is this underlying assumption yeah. of, of what you believe about certain political or, or, you know, political issues or whatever, whatever. So for me to come out and to say very plainly, I am not just pro LGBTQ, but, but this is an image of God. This is a mm -hmm. part of the image of God that 
to use the Bible as a, as a way to shame or to contort or confine or temper mm -hmm. into what you have pre-qualified as, as God's accepted way of being is to refuse the image of God. And come on somebody. And what are, and what are we here for, but to collectively display this image of God. And so I have received a lot of pushback over the last six months. <laughs> um, uh, literally, I think like 12, 15,000 people who have, you know, decided to unfollow, which is okay, because what I realize is that to question things and to re-examine things and to be vocal about your beliefs and about your truth and who you support and what you love um, makes people uncomfortable because there's a degree of certitude that comes with God being so easily qualified and quantifiable. Right. You know, and the reason we do this and the mm -hmm. reason I believe that that people love this is that it creates this kind of moral hierarchy within our system. So Say I it. know I know where I fall with you. Like I know who's better or worse or who God more or less approves us of. But when when we are equals and when we're not only just equal, but we are necessary to display the image of God then mm. then it's imper it's imperative it's paramount to yeah why we're here oh course in miracles lesson number 186 says i am integral to god's plan for salvation for the earth to understand mm. that god's image without me is incomplete and therefore god is depending on me god has chosen mm. me god trusts me with this world to bring it back to a state of love, to bring it back to a state of sanity, to bring it out of a state where we are of a fearful dream. And the same thing with every single one of us. Mm. And so we share this idea to grow it and make it stronger, to say that just like, no, 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 it's like, and that's I think where the, um, the fearful dream of white supremacy kind of sneaks in. And what it wants to say is like, if you let this person matter, they will come for you. Mm. You know, there's retribution. And I think that in, you know, I want to say like, this is like, it's like, sounds like the voice of the devil to me. It sounds accusatory. Because okay. if you listen to what black people are saying, that's not what they're saying. They're saying, we please don't shoot us. Right. And people are, okay. and so it's very interesting to me. I'm like, if you just listen a little bit, you would realize that all of this, this whole plan, God, when I say God's plan for salvation for the world, I mean liberation for everybody in real time. Yes. And if you can see that it's in your best interest to help this person, because mm. technically, not even technically, it is helping you, mm. why wouldn't you want that? That to me sounds like the kingdom of God. Yeah, I think absolutely. Mm. It's interesting, you know, when we talk about Black Lives Matter and this amazing necessary movement that is happening. I mm. think about the women's rights and yes. and how like women could march and we could wave our flags and we could uh, be as intelligent and well versed as possible and write as many things as we could. But at the end of the day, mm -hmm. men had to offer us our suffrage. Mm. Men had to give us our equal right because they held the power. And so white, any white person in America who would like to politely excuse themselves from this movement doesn't realize that when we're in a system mm. of racism, systemic racism mm. from the top down, um, we have to be a part of this fight because if you the are necessary. white Americans are in, yes, if white Americans are the ones in charge and holding the power, then that equality and from the top has to come from the top down. Yeah. And it comes, it really, it, I kind of just think of it almost like, I, I, I picture like, you know, that's almost, I, the image I have in my head is like a big ivory tower, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And it's like everybody inside is realizing that there are people outside and they just never knew. There's people outside mm -hmm. hurting and suffering. Oh, we have all this food inside. We have all these medicine inside. 
-hmm. What if we just took it out there? It's really as simple as that. And that what I think is it's it's funny to me how people get so threatened by that image where everybody and I'm like that's why I was I'm just like what is so like what are you afraid of? But when you're in a system that is serving you, if you're a white American, then of course. You know, oh, why would yeah. you want to disrupt it if it's serving you? Mm-hmm. And that's like what I, I think that was something I had to, I, I often like, I had to say like, I'm so thankful for my queerness. And this is something mm-hmm. I think a few of my queer Christian and queer faith friends would say is that like, if it wasn't for our queerness, um, we don't know if we would have examined anything else. Um, oh, yeah. Because like I'm white passing, I'm Mexican, but like, grew up in a military family, upper middle class. Mm -hmm. If I wasn't queer, I would have no, I I don't know, I don't know. I could, I can't tell you what have happened because I was, I was very sheltered. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I would have met the right person to kind of shake me out out of it. I don't know if I would have as easily been able to, to come to into myself and come back to God, if you will. And so like, I look at like my queerness is just like, I used to, it used to be this thing where I looked at it and I was like, God, why me? But I'm just like, thank God it was me yes. because I understand. So like I had less to unlearn, I think yeah. because of it. Yes. And that's, so it's like, uh, that's one thing. And then also I think we, being queer is really fun. Just, yeah. <laughs> I love that so much. Like, hey, I think we, you're so right. The, it's um have you read the book falling upward by richard Rohr? come on rich yes good old richie that and the immortal life diamond is, oh my goodness yes but the way that life just so poetically kind of pushes us into the second half and mm-hmm. is miraculous to me it's almost as if we can die even while still being alive mm-hmm. and and have a entirely new future ahead of us when you are living from a different perspective yeah that's a great way of putting it and i think like you know to quote a, i don't know if you've heard of this dude named jesus big fan of this <laughs> um but uh he the the saying of just like those who seek to save their life will lose it but those who lose it for mm-hmm. my sake will find it i look at like all those spaces because like i was a missionary i was a worship leader like i was working my way up the system i was gonna be somebody i was gonna be like i'm like i'm gonna join the house fires i'm gonna be like on stage stephen curtis chapman look out Mm -hmm. uh and it was so shocking to me how like when all of that just like it just clicked i'm like oh i can't do this anymore Mm. because of just this one thing Mm. because like and that, that, I think like it was, uh, it took a long, well, let me ask you this question, actually. Do you still, like, when you look at, I'm, I'm wrestling with the identity of Christian myself right now. Yeah. I'm like, am I a Christian still? Because yeah. I look at everything and I'm like, I love Jesus. Yeah. Oh, I remember my original point. My ADD took me away. I'm sorry. Let me go back to the original <laughs> point and then I'm going to go to that question. The okay. original point of losing your life. Uh, when we were in that world, we would have done anything to, to save our life, so to speak, or what mm-hmm. we thought was our life, what, you know, to, to cling on to these identities and these illusions that made yeah. us feel safe. Yeah. Um, and then we, you know, for me, I came out, lost everything and said, like, just, I, and I said, like, I believe that this is where Jesus was leading me. I'm like, I lost my entire life for Jesus' mm-hmm. sake. And guess mm-hmm. what? Found it. Right. Found everything. And I have not met a single human on this planet, whether you're, you're a queer person who's coming out of the closet in some way, shape or form, or, or a person who is stating publicly that they are an ally. Mm-hmm. There's in some, if you come from evangelical world, there is a loss there, but I've never met anybody who didn't find more on the other side. Amen. I would, I've said it before, but I would lose everything I had to lose to save my spirit. I would lose again every damn day and twice yeah. on Sundays. <laughs> I would. Yeah. I would. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sorry that it has to, that it is that way. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm sorry that it is that way. It's like the church pre- 
preaches, not the church collectively, but some of these mm. churches preach the grace that they're honestly not capable of giving. Yeah. When face to face with humanity, I have received so many emails, hundreds of emails from people who have been mm. rejected by the religious institution just to find their faith. You know, women who have stepped out of abusive home context or stepped out mm. of seemingly perfect marriages, um, mm. not listened to. One woman said, What is it? She said, I was meeting with the elder board and I said, What is it going to take? Are they going to, am I going to have to have a black eye in order for you to like allow me to leave this abusive marriage? And they basically said, yes. And so for her to step outside of what was popular, what the status quo or what they were comfortable with, I mean, she lost her entire church family Jesus. by truly saving herself in the lives mm -hmm. of her children. Yes. And, Ooh, yes. But you look at Jesus. And he's the one, if anyone was justified to pick up the stone for the adulteress, the, the, I call her the woman caught by grace instead of the woman caught in adultery. <laughs> you better reframe that. You better we reframe that. We have to that. reframe it. We do. We call her the woman caught in adultery, but she was the woman caught by grace. And if anyone had the right to, or would be justified to pick up a stone, it would have mm. been Jesus himself. But And Jesus didn't fucking care. He didn't care yeah. and, and not even did he not care, but he got down in the dirt. Mm -hmm. I'm like, this is what the church needs to do. This is what we need to do mm -hmm. as, as lovers of God mm -hmm. and of yeah. Jesus is meet one another in the dirt. Yeah. And I think additionally that story there is that when told through, like, you know, we, we see it and it's told through a very specific lens and then um, folks like Lisa Sharon Harper and, Oh, what is her name? Dr. Janiqua Brown, uh, Dr. Janiqua <laughs> Barnes. Dr. Yes. Janiqua Barnes, they're always pointing to those, those texts and saying, well, where was the man? Because here's mm. the deal. A woman, it's, it's very unlikely that she would have had the power in that situation to like, was she really caught in adultery or was she being assaulted? Right. Was she, uh, you know, we don't know anything else about her. Was she a young woman? Was she possibly mm -hmm. a child still? Mm -hmm. You know, we don't know anything about her besides this was, was woman. Right. Yeah. And so I look absolutely. at that story and I'm just like, and I was like, I wonder like, because like, you know, y women and young girls were, it was customary. Marry them mm -hmm. off their property. Mm -hmm. And so what if, Jesus, what if she was 14? Right. And Jesus sat down with her and just said, oh my God, you guys are fucking like look at yourselves throw a stone <laughs> i throw a stone at this 14 year old girl i dare you oh oh and I that, know. that that that's it's like all of these stories that just like just like don't be adult go and sin no more i'm just like that's the one thing i'm just like what if the sin was not the thing about the adultery what if the sin was uh anything that separates us from god right so what if she like, had a mindset of her she's like oh yeah i am bad. oh yeah i am dirty mm -hmm. and it's like no 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 don't sin don't think like right. that what right. if he was saying change your mind right you know change your mind about what they said about you mm. Ooh, ooh. yes come that's on so Ex good. Jesus. yeah the over romanticism of biblical stories has mm. always has always ne it's never settled well you know, mm -hmm. we look at Esther and we praise her as some sort of heroic mm -hmm. picture of Christendom. And the reality is that she was probably 12 or 13 mm -hmm. when she was basically sex trafficked by the king mm -hmm. and hoarded up in a house with hundreds of other young little girls mm -hmm. and forced to have sex with a man. Mm -hmm. And also has and to save her people at the same time. Like and then saves her people. I mean... But the over romanticism, mm -hmm. you know, we, we create movies and games about this and we're, we're completely um, lacking just the reality of what yeah. is actually happening. It's like you David, know? like David is my favorite. Like everyone's like, oh my God, King David. I'm just like, you guys, he raped Bathsheba. Mm -hmm. He raped his general's wife and then sent him to battle. Yes. And also was probably secretly gay with Jonathan. Like, talk about a pressure mm -hmm. cooker of emotions, mama. But also, it doesn't make it right. You don't, just because, like, you have, like, 
a bad day, you don't just get to rape someone. Like, thank God. Right. You can be a man after God's own heart and like, and still like, it just shows you power, what power does. Mm -hmm. Yes. Shows you how, uh, and that this is also like the, the flip side of the thing. It's just like, I look at like King David as like this um, kind of like symbol of all the people who are caught up in power, mm. who are in love with power, mm-hmm. who like think that power is going to keep them safe. And so right. time and time again, the story of King David is God saying, if you're doing wrong, I'm not going to keep you safe. Mm. And it's not even that I'm not going to keep you safe. It's that like, you're not doing what you're supposed to do and you are reaping your own consequences. Mm. Yeah. Power has to protect itself, you know, Mm. in order for it to stay where it is. And I, I feel like so many times when the Bible is used as a way to weaponize or a tool Mm. to, to shame, it's, it's typically in an effort to protect the ego and to protect the power. It's like, it's got to step on the necks of someone in order Mm. to make itself feel a few inches taller Mm -hmm. Um, because that's how fragile Mm -hmm. that faith actually is, you know, and, and I experienced it when, you know, you're sitting on the bathroom floor and someone says, well, do you want to press charges or forgive? And then it was never spoken about, you know, Mm -hmm. I didn't tell my parents for 10 years, but, Oh yeah. But the reality is that it would have, they would have had to get in the dirt with me, you Mm -hmm. know, they would have had to set down the dirt with me like Jesus and, and the, the, the girl, whoever she was, Mm -hmm. um, but in order to do that, in order to get in the dirt, you've got to lay your power aside. Yeah. And you need oh. to power. We just preached like eight sermons. <laughs> oh. I love speaking to you about that. I want to be I want to be legitimate friends with you. Like you're so yeah. you're so full of life. And like I can legitimately feel how much you care about people. And I, I do. oof. It like gets me like I'm feeling emotions behind my eyes, and so that's why I'm closing mm-hmm. them. But it um, it is very encouraging for mm-hmm. me to like continue to get to have these conversations with with more and more people because it's like oh my gosh, like this dream that so many people are catching, like the vision of mm-hmm. of uh, I you know it's like. So a little story about me. When I was in uh, missionary world uh, in Pentecostalism, I remember uh, this one <laughs> traveling prophetic preacher. Um, oh, you know what's so funny? All throughout like my teens and my early 20s, I kept getting these prophetic words like, you're going to be a pastor. And I'm just like, I'm not going to be a fucking pastor. I don't <laughs> want to do that. Um, lo and behold. Lo and behold. There you are. Um, but it's like, it just, I, I remember the first time I heard uh, this one traveling preacher prophesy say, revival. Mm. Just revival. And I was like, I was very into that because like for me, I could see it as this thing where like people coming back to God. And I still want that. But when I say people coming back to God, I mean, I want people to understand that, that they never were apart from God. Mm. I want people to wake up to the reality of their own createdness as is your own createdness is God. Yes. Like this whole thing, this whole thing, like, mm. like this, this whole body yes. that you're in, this whole experience you're having is God. And oh. on top of that, it's, um, it's like the, it's the self-realization and then the the self-realization out in this direction where um like reverend william barber will call it and like a bunch of civil rights leaders call it like a revival of moral imagination hmm. um ooh, you know who you need to uh i'm gonna send you a book link too um uh there's a book called see no stranger yes, by, I'd love to read it. oh by valerie uh i don't know how to pronounce her last name sorry girl valerie cower k-a-u-e-r she mm-hmm. is a a sikh woman um incredible incredibly prolific speaker activist um filmmaker and the way she talks about faith love god i just i'm like oh that's the one anyways the revival of the moral imagination i think is like i'm like oh that's the church that's the like when i think about like when and when i say god the church i mean god's body i mean god's people I mean, mm-hmm. it's fine. It's almost just like 
we have entered a time and a space where like the cocoon is finally breaking open mm -hmm. and we're flying away and the cocoon is trying to hold on and say, no, you can't get out of here. Right. But the butterfly, she always get out. Yes. <laughs> yes always. Does. Like you can't stop what nature is already doing. Mm -hmm. Like the butterfly is about to fly away. She's about to join a entire, what is it? Isn't there a bunch of uh, those butterflies that migrate? Yes. The monarch. She's get, the monarch. Ooh, come on, kings. Come on, <laughs> Symbolism, my God. Well, I love that about nature. I think God has has like imputed himself in all of his creation, which is mm. why we have a winter to spring, which is why we have the ebb and the flow of the waters, which is why we have this regeneration, you know, the mm. circle of life, even like nature itself is like screaming of redemption hmm. screaming of this this story this regenerative uh story this redemptive story of god yeah. which is taking you know purposefully allowing us to go dormant and then be rebirthed you know mm -hmm. to die and be reborn to winter to spring Yes. To freeze and thaw. Like that's that is the way of nature and it is the way of humanity. And yeah. So often I'll in the mornings I I live in an apartment and I'm like seventeen floors up and I'll look out at this neighborhood. And I just think to myself, because I'll watch like the woman watering her flowers and I'll watch the little girl playing in the backyard with her dog and I think you are created in the image of God. You are bearing mm. a fraction of God within you and what do you need to hear and what do you need to read and what words do you need to listen mm. to that will awaken that image mm. of that image of god within you you mm. know that proclivity that way that you love that expression yes. um, that creativity that's oh, the man. work that's one liberated the person to the next oh that is the word i'm so into you i'm so <laughs> As Ariana Grande once said, I'm so into you, I can barely breathe. <laughs>